on World News Tonight. Deteriorating rights. The Taliban continues to deprive Afghans of right to protest in the latest instance of Taliban human rights violations. Phasing out. The journey towards nuclear disarmament moves even closer as a new head comes up with new policies. Rising tensions. India plays an edgy game as the Indian Army tests weapons near the Indochina border. Musk's philanthropy. Elon Musk's Starlink provides internet to schools in rural Chile. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with yet again with another look into Taliban-run Afghanistan. Popular opposition to the Taliban has now spread to several Afghan cities, although there are uh, reports of people being killed by either militant gunfire or stampedes caused by it. Protests against the Taliban have now spread to more Afghan cities and several more people have been killed at the rallies, according to witnesses, by either the militants firing their weapons or the panic and stampedes caused by it. One of the protests in the capital, Kabul, a witness in the area said that it appeared to be the Taliban firing their weapons into the air. Although on Wednesday, media reported that Taliban fighters fired directly into a crowd of other protesters in the city of Jalalabad, killing three people. And on Thursday, a witness at a protest in the city of Asadabad said more people were killed there, although it wasn't clear if they were killed by gunfire, a stampede, or both. A Taliban spokesperson was not immediately available for comment. August 19th is the day that Afghanistan typically celebrates its Independence Day, when it gained independence from British rule in 1919. Some of the gatherings have been small in size, but it underlines the challenge facing the Taliban to govern the country and project a more moderate image. Meanwhile, dramatic new images have been pouring in from Kabul's airport as U.S. and allied forces struggle to keep the massive crowds inside and outside under control. A little girl here being lifted over the perimeter fence by American troops filmed on Tuesday. On Wednesday, tear gas as the soldiers try to keep the crowds back. Thousands of people are here. As of Thursday, about 8,000 Afghans and foreigners have been evacuated, according to a Western official. The U.S. alone says it's trying to get out 22,000 at-risk Afghans. Over in the White House, on the defensive, following a rocky few days after a heavily criticized troop withdrawal from Afghanistan, U.S. President Joe Biden has clarified his position on defending Washington's numerous allies around the world, including South Korea. U.S. President Joe Biden is insisting that Washington's allies like South Korea, Taiwan and European countries are fundamentally different from Afghanistan in terms of U.S. security commitment and don't have to worry despite the developments seen over the past few days. He made the remarks during an interview that aired in the U.S. on Wednesday local time. His comments come as concerns are rising over Biden's decision to suddenly pull American troops out of Afghanistan, which was quickly retaken by the Taliban. President Biden claimed there's a fundamental difference between Taiwan, South Korea and NATO, adding the U.S. has made agreements with those with a unity government not based on a civil war. Biden stressed the U.S. is trying to keep bad guys from doing bad things to them. He also emphasized that the U.S. has kept every commitment it has given to its allies. President Biden noted how the White House made a sacred commitment to NATO's Article 5, which means if anyone invades or takes action against another NATO member, the U.S. will respond. That goes for South Korea as well. In the meantime, U.S. State Department spokesperson Ned Price said Thursday that, quote, it's safe to say that this administration has prioritized our system of alliances and partnerships in profound ways, and we've done that because we recognize them as a profound source of strength. He added that this is the reason Secretary Blinken has consulted with NATO allies, because when it comes to Afghanistan, they're making decisions in close coordination. Beaten, homes raided, turned away from work for being a woman. 
The complaints made by some Afghan journalists in recent days are sowing doubt about assurance made by their new Taliban rulers that independent media would be allowed. Women's rights and free speech have been hard-fought gains in Afghanistan over the last two decades of war. When last in power in 2001, the Taliban had barred women from holding jobs. But in what would have been unthinkable back then, a female journalist interviewed a Taliban spokesperson earlier this week after the group secured power in the capital, Kabul. In their first press conference since capturing the city, the Islamist militant movement said Tuesday it would allow free media and jobs for women. But some journalists aren't convinced. Saad Moseni, who heads the largest private broadcaster in Afghanistan, told on Thursday it's too early to tell what the Taliban's policies will be. The laissez-faire approach is more a reflection of not having enough bandwidth than a specific policy that they would allow media to carry on um, business as usual as they have been over the last two decades. So I wouldn't get too excited. It's, it's only been like you know, 72 hours. I mean, since they <laughs> took over the take over took over the city, and it's just their 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 senior officials are just arriving in Kabul. You know, like now. A Taliban spokesperson said on Tuesday that media must not work against Islamic values, and that women could work quote within the framework of Islam. Media watchdogs have reported incidents this week of Afghan journalists being beaten, harassed, or raided at their homes. In one example, a presenter on state-owned radio television Afghanistan, Sahar Nasari, wrote on Facebook that members of the Taliban took his camera and beat up his colleague while he was trying to film a story in Kabul. He said, quote, It has become clear there is a gap between action and words. A Taliban spokesperson did not respond to a request for comment on accusations that it has harassed journalists, and particularly women in the profession. Indian Army personnel deployed to the Chinese border in eastern Indian Sikkim state held drills with Bofors guns. For more on this, we have other there in a world news special correspondent Gayatri Gunasekhar reporting now from Delhi in India. Gayatri. Yes, Shainali. The nuclear armed neighbors have been on the toes uh, since a clash in Galwan Valley last year led to deaths of 20 Indian soldiers and at least four Chinese troops. This region witnessed the 2017 Dokram Cache where hundreds of troops from both sides were deployed in 2017 on the plateau near the borders of India, its ally Bhutan and China after India objected to Chinese construction of a road in the Himalayan area. The Swedish 155mm gun was primarily used during the 1999 Kargil war against Pakistan and it was inducted in the Indian Army in the late 80s. The tensions grew more when India established an Indian Ocean security bloc. A new multilateral grouping has emerged in the Indian Ocean and its ripples are likely to uh, be felt in the South China Sea. The Colombo Security Conclave, including India, Sri Lanka and the Maldives, last week hosted its second meeting in the eight months, during which the neighbors emphasized four pillars of cooperation, including marine security, terrorism, human trafficking and cyber security. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar reporting from Delhi in India. Over in Africa now, the government of Burkina Faso stated that the death toll from an attack on civilians and the military in northern Burkina Faso has risen to 80 people. The death toll in an attack on civilians and military personnel in northern Burkina Faso has climbed to at least 80. That's according to the country's regional Sahel government on Thursday. The attack happened on Wednesday, when Islamist militants raided a convoy being escorted by military police. Security forces said at least 80 militants were also killed. Wednesday's attack is the latest in a series of attacks in the Sahel across West Africa this month. The Sahel, an arid strip of land bordering the south edge of the Sahara Desert, has been made ungovernable by armed Islamists. Despite the presence of thousands of UN, regional and western troops, violence there has only intensified in recent years. Thousands of civilians have been killed and millions more displaced since 2018. Still in Africa, a spokesperson for the UN Secretary General said that humanitarian access into Ethiopia's Tigray region is restricted more than nine months after war broke out in the region. The situation in Tigray remains unpredictable and volatile. 
a spokesperson for the UN Secretary General has said. Conflict in the northern Ethiopian region broke out more than nine months ago between federal forces and those aligned with the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Having retaken control of most of Tigray in late June and early July, Tigrayan forces have pushed into the adjoining Afar and Amhara provinces. Last week, they captured the United Nations World Heritage Site of Lalibela. Updating journalists on Wednesday, the UN's Stefan Dujaric said Tigrayan forces continue to move in Amhara and Afar. Humanitarian access into the region remains restricted uh, via the only road through Afar region where there, is, uh, where there is insecurity with extended delays for clearance of humanitarian supplies and intense searches of trucks at these checkpoints. Only 30 trucks with humanitarian supplies can be scanned each day under the current procedures. But as we've been telling you, we need 100 trucks of food, non-food items and fuel needed every day to go into Tigray. The war has killed thousands of people and sparked a refugee crisis. In July, the UN warned that more than 100,000 children in Tigray could suffer life-threatening malnutrition over the next year. Jujarek said there are 457 UN staff from 10 agencies supporting the humanitarian response in the region. And that 29 mobile health teams had provided essential services to more than 50,000 people. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. We have some good news for you. The new head of the body that would police a global ban on nuclear tests hopes to bring that ban into force by breaking down the main barrier, getting countries such as Iran and Pakistan to ratify it into regional clusters. Rob Floyd, a 63-year-old veteran of nuclear diplomacy and former biologist from Australia, took over these months as head of the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. His organization already runs a network of more than 300 monitoring stations around the world that use seismic, hydroacoustic and other technologies to check for secret nuclear explosions. Bringing the treaty into force would enable it to carry out on-site inspections as well as making the ban binding. To do that, however, the last eight of the 44 countries listed in an annex to the 1996 treaty must ratify it. China, Egypt, Iran, Israel and the United States have signed out not ratified. North Korea, India and Pakistan have not signed it. However, he stated that the individual understanding is critical as a starting point and some of them aggregate into regions of interest, whether it's India and Pakistan or in the Middle East area like Iran, Israel and Egypt. In the Caribbean now, a drip of foreign aid began to reach more rural areas of southwestern Haiti, arriving five days after a powerful earthquake killed more than 2,000 and flattening tens of thousands of buildings into rubble. In Likai, emergency aid trickles into the local airport, days after a 7.2 magnitude earthquake devastated Haiti's southwest peninsula. Meanwhile, in Jérémy, residents are still shifting rubble by hand. The town's hospitals are filled to capacity with injured residents, many of them with broken and injured legs. Doctors say that supplies are severely lacking. The aid response has been delayed by damage to mountain roads. NGOs have also been forced to negotiate passage with the armed gangs that have blighted the country's security in recent years. Those challenges were compounded by the arrival of Tropical Storm Grace this week flooding many of the buildings still standing and washing away temporary shelters. Meanwhile, the country remains in political turmoil following the assassination of President Jovenel Moyes in July. Le pays tout Current Prime Minister Physical Ariel Henry has vowed not to repeat the mismanagement of aid that followed Haiti's 2010 earthquake, a disaster that claimed more than 200,000 lives. 
Over in France, the French government decreed that two more countries, namely Morocco and Algeria, are now put on red alert, thus restricting entry from all citizens of the said countries. More on this, let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting now from Normandy in France. Chetana. Yes, Shanali. French authorities reported that the number of patients being treated in intensive care units for COVID-19 has risen above 2,000 for the first time since June 14th. That figure has more than doubled in a less than a month as highly contagious Delta variant of coronavirus is putting a renewed strain on the French hospital system. France has added Algeria and Morocco to its list of countries deemed high-risk COVID-19 zones as it battles a fourth wave of infections. The new measures which will take effect means people arriving from the two African countries will have to undergo strict protocol measures such as self-isolating. The government decided this as the Delta variant puts renewed strain on the hospital system, thus bringing in the risk of overflowing and depletion of medical resources. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adha Dharana World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Cuba introduced tighter controls on the use of social media this week, including a ban on publications that might damage the country's prestige, angering many citizens and international rights activists. Cuba rolled out tighter controls on social media on Tuesday that target, quote, enemy activity on the Internet. Decree 35 comes on the heels of the largest anti-government protests the island nation has seen in years. Cuba's president blamed last month's demonstration on an online campaign by U.S.-backed counter-revolutionaries. The new controls ban the spread of false news, content deemed offensive, or that, quote, incite mobilizations or other acts that upset public order. It also offers Cubans a form to report offenders. Cuba's vice minister of communications took to state TV on Tuesday. Decree 35 does not specify penalties for breaking the law, but said any attempts to subvert order will be considered cyber terrorism. Some analysts say the law's vague definitions would allow the government to arbitrarily prosecute Cubans it considers dissidents. Cuba's new law explicitly orders the state telecoms monopoly to suspend services to users who have violated Decree 35. Welcome back and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Tesla CEO Elon Musk said the company will probably have a prototype of a humanoid robot called Teslabot by 2022, saying the robot would eliminate dangerous, repetitive, boring tasks now performed by humans. Law enforcement officials were negotiating with a man who said that he had a bomb in his pickup truck near the U.S. capital, causing nearly buildings to be evacuated as emergency vehicles rushed to the scene about a mile from the White House. A helicopter from Spain's Salvamento Maritimo rescued a woman who was found by a cargo ship 135 miles off the Canary Islands after a dinghy carrying migrants capsized. Chinese astronauts Ni Haisheng and Liu Boming had both slipped out of the space station core module Tianhe to conduct extravehicular activities for a second time, according to the China Manned Space Agency. And finally tonight, American billionaire Elon Musk's own firm Starlink will soon start offering satellite internet connections in Chile. Schools and government officials in the remote towns of Caleta Sierra and Sotomo will be the first to receive the service. In the small fishing hamlet of Sotomo, Chile, more than 600 miles south of Santiago, seven-year-old Diego Guerrero travels by boat to school each day with his dad, Carlos, the two often battling wind and rain to get there. It's a remote existence, with Sotomo itself reachable only by water, its rocky coastline dotted with brightly colored wooden and tin houses inhabited by the hamlet's mere 20 families who make their living catching mussels and fish to sell at market some five hours away. But on a recent day, Diego and his schoolmates found themselves connected to the world in a way they could never have imagined. Their school was chosen as one of two places in Chile to receive free internet for a year, part of a pilot program run by billionaire Elon Musk. 
Using tablets provided by the Education Ministry, the school's seven pupils can tap into online learning, watch films, take virtual museum tours, and make video calls to children in other schools. The program is run by satellite company Starlink, a division of Musk's SpaceX, which aims to roll out 12,000 satellites to provide broadband internet services around the world with a focus on remote areas. The signal is received via a satellite dish installed on the school's roof, which transmits through a Wi-Fi device to most of its facilities. Eventually, the plan is to extend it to the rest of the hamlet. It only works from noon to midnight due to a limited supply of diesel for the generator that supplies power to Sotomo. Nonetheless, it is a significant upgrade to the patchy mobile internet signal that residents currently can get on their phones by leaning out of windows or paddling out into the bay. Diego, whose favorite subject is math, wants to be a sailor, but his father hopes his son's new window on the world will help broaden his horizons. And that is it from World News tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.